Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Financial Issues Forum, featuring Cheryl Strauss Einhorn. She will discuss her new book, Problem Solver, Maximizing Your Strengths to Make Better Decisions, with Paul Johnson, adjunct professor at Fordham's Gabelli School of Business. I'm Jim Kelly, director of the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis at Fordham. On behalf of the Gabelli School, welcome. The Financial Issues Forum is organized by the Gabelli Center, along with our co-presenters, the Museum of American Finance and the CFA Society of New York. Today's webinar is the final one scheduled prior to our summer break. The series will resume in September with a full schedule of events. Cheryl and Paul will speak together for about 30 minutes, followed by Q&A from our viewers. Please submit your questions through the question field that is located below the video player. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during our event. We will be addressing as many as possible during the session. All attendees at today's event will be receiving digital copies of Cheryl's book with information coming to you following our event. And now I'm delighted to turn it over to David Cowan, president of the Museum of American Finance, to introduce Cheryl and Paul. Jim, great to see you again, and our CFA friends, the museum audience, our Fordham friends, uh, as we conclude this part of the season. Uh, our speaker today has a career that encompasses three parts as professor, practitioner, and author. First, Cheryl teaches at both Cornell and Columbia Universities. Second, she founded Decisive, which is a decision science company that trains people and teams in complex problem solving. And third, she writes initially as an investigative journalist with articles published in places like the New York Times, Barron's, Harvard Business Review, among others. And now she has authored her third book as she strives to help us make better decisions. If you enjoy what you see today, please follow Cheryl on LinkedIn or check out her TED Talk. Cheryl will be in conversation with Paul Johnson, who also wears three hats as professor, practitioner, and author. Paul teaches at both Columbia and the Fordham Business Schools and has received excellence in teaching awards at both institutions. He's the founding partner and investment manager at Nakusa Capital, and he's the co-author of multiple books, including the recent work, The Enduring Value of Roger Murray, where earlier this year at Fordham, we joined Paul when he was in conversation with two of Murray's former students, Leon Cooperman and, of course, Mario Gabelli. Cheryl and Paul met while teaching at Columbia, and so it's my pleasure to turn it over to these two colleagues in conversation. I think I proceeded to not. Uh, thank you very much. Cheryl, great to see you and congratulations on your new book. Thank you. So excited to be here with you today. Oh, I am too. Uh, we've, uh, I think we did a similar event for your last book, so it's fun to be back on this book. Absolutely. All right. So the big question is, what prompted you to write this book? Well, really it's what I learned from writing both Problem Solved and Investing in Financial Research. When I put out initially Problem Solved and introduced the area method, I was so surprised by the incredibly wide adoption that it got. It was received by students, whether in K through 12, mostly high schools, obviously, but also at universities, and it was received by people from all different kinds of businesses and industries and, you know, counterterrorism professionals and, you know, groups that might be solving financial questions. Yet what I realized is while everybody can use area, people tend to use a knowledge system not as it is, but as they are. And that really begged the question, who are we as decision makers? Why do some people find it so much easier? So for students, for example, to use the relative phase of area where we conduct literature reviews, for example, or why do intelligence people really like to do 
interviews, but maybe feel less value that they need to understand the landscape because they feel like they already know it. So in investigating, how do we as individuals approach our problems? What I realized is that if we could have this information first, it would tell us why we tend to like certain types of data collection and why we tend to skip over or maybe devalue other parts of a knowledge system so that we could figure out what we're good at and we can lean into the discomfort of where there's growth for us as decision makers. And eventually that became what I call my problem solver profiles. And when did you realize you probably had a book as opposed to extending what you did in problem solved? I think that's a great question too, because sometimes an article will do, right? But in thinking about this, one of the things that I've given my readers in all three of my books is this idea of the cheetah sheets. And so let me just explain that for a minute. The cheetah, although she's the fastest land animal accelerating to over 60 miles an hour, she decelerates up to nine miles an hour in a single stride. And that's where she builds her agility, her flexibility and maneuverability. And that's what you need in a quality research and due diligence process. So throughout all three of my books, as I pay attention to timing as a very important component of decision-making, I have these cheetah sheets where I give people worksheets. They are questions that can guide your thinking, both of where you should look for information and what kind of analysis to do. And so in thinking about how for this new book, I could really translate this idea into immediate practical application where you can rip the ideas out of the page and plug them into your life. I wanted to have all of these cheetah sheets where people could have exercises where they directly engage with their problem solver profile, with the other problem solver profiles, and with that very important intersection of how we work well with others. So I realized it was a book when I thought about what are the tools to translate this idea of problem solver profiles into practical action. And so throughout Problem Solver, I have not only the cheetah sheets as a worksheet that people can use, but for every worksheet, I also have one filled out by a client who I've worked with. So you can see how these questions guide your thinking, your analysis, and then give you that epiphany or the aha about why this really reduces friction and can strengthen your relationships as you make decisions alone and with others. Well, it sounds a little bit like, although this is your latest book, it maybe is the book someone should read first. Is that? So I think that's an interesting idea because I do agree with you. You don't have to have read either of the other books to really appreciate the immediate self-knowledge that you can get from this. So I do think as an entry point or even as a standalone, it's, it's the right book to read because you'll immediately figure out where is it that you have your natural habits and patterns of behavior that are comfortable for you for how you've engaged in your decisions, and then how can you be more dynamic? Yes, certainly. I read your books in the order you published them, but when I was reading through Problem, Sol Problem Solver, I really reflected that having that knowledge as I went through Problem Solved, it would give me a lens from which I approach the cheetah sheets. And I have a better reflection of, oh wait, I, I lean towards this. I, leaned, I kept leaning towards this in my cheetah sheets. And once I read Problem Solver, I then started to see that pattern. And so it dawned on me that having that, even though this is sort of the latest book, reading this before Problem Solved might be ben very beneficial for your readers. Absolutely. And I think it really shows that we're constantly learning about ourselves. I had to write those first two books to see what mistakes I made or to see what people really needed to better understand how to make better decisions. So when we think about access, we tend to think, or we think about equity, we tend to think about access. But as I was saying, we don't use knowledge systems as they are, we use them as we are. Yeah, yeah. And so that's exactly right. If you can understand your problem solver profile first, you really give yourself an opportunity to no longer say, oh, I only need to do this and I don't need to do that. What you really want to say is I've skipped over this because I have habits and patterns that are comfortable. And it's not because these other parts 
of the area method are less important, in fact, because they're uncomfortable. Maybe that's what I should really be leaning into in order to better check and challenge my biases and make better decisions. Yeah, for those people that aren't masochists and try to write books like you and me, I think they don't fully understand how much you learn in the process of writing a book. So my question for you, what was the, I guess, how did the book change you, writing this book? How did it change you? Well, I think a lot of times we tend to separate out our work life from our home life. And I think it really dawned on me as I was really going through the research and collecting the different stories of the people who I'd worked with that I wanted to put in the book that I wasn't really applying this so much to my own personal relationships. And it was a huge aha when I realized, gee, I could apply this to my relationship with my mother, for example. And it absolutely transformed my relationship. And it took so long to wonder why professional Cheryl and personal Cheryl were doing different things, that I should be adopting this too. And when I saw the difference that it made, I just got so excited that this really worked for me the way it has worked for all of these people who I've had the great good fortune to help in their decision making. Yeah, from a personal perspective, as interesting as I read the book, um, it was obvious to me instantly what profile I had. Um, but what the real, I guess the big breakthrough for me was realizing the, that it was very powerful in a good way to understand the profiles of the people that were in my life, professionally and personally, and to then have a better sense of how they processed information, made decisions, because then it made it much easier for me to be empathetic and much easier to be connected to them because now I could present data in a way that, I mean, not to manipulate them, but to, in a way where they would most appreciate the information. So for me, it was almost more reflective of the people I interact with regularly than necessarily myself, although I did learn a lot in that, that realm as well. Yeah, I want to address something that you said. You talked about empathy. Um, I think oftentimes we can feel empathy for another person without knowing what are the practical steps to take. What does inclusion actually look like as a practice or perspective taking? And the problem solver profiles is inclusion in action, right? Because it actually shares with you how different problem solvers are optimizing for different things in their decisions, what that means, therefore, that they value differently in a decision. So when you're in conversation with somebody and you've been able to identify their problem solver profile because you've learned how to listen to them, or maybe you know them well enough to actually take the problem solver profile quiz, you know what kind of information to come to them with for them to be able to engage in a decision. And you also know how much time within the spectrum of the different problem solver profiles are they going to need to actually get comfortable in making that decision? I think there's one more aspect of it, at least I took away, is that you can be a real aid to somebody. If you're a different profile than they are, knowing what their natural biases may be, doesn't mean they will be, being aware of that and helping on that side as well, I thought was a very powerful insight. I think that's exactly right. You now know what somebody else needs, what are their information needs, and you also really understand the value of having intellectual diversity because the different problem solver profiles are coming at a problem from different vantage points. And it's really the fulsomeness of the five different profiles together, which give you the bigger understanding of the problem that you're solving. And what I think is interesting is even though we often have groups or teams together that look like they're different, that look like we've got diverse voices together, we may not have intellectual diversity in the room of thought. And so understanding all five of the problem solver profiles, no matter what the complexion is of the group that you have assembled, you can bring in questions from the vantage point of the missing problem solver profile. So your team, your family, your group of decision makers can still get that more fulsome understanding of the decision at hand. Yeah, I wanna unpack that momentarily, but I wanna frame something. So for me, read the book first was big ahas on insight onto my own 
problem solver and interesting some things I have learned to counterbalance natural biases. You and I were talking about confirmation bias. I've come up with some tools to help me there. The next big aha I had in the book is to say, oh my God, these individuals that I work with on a regular basis, personally and professionally, if I have a better sense on how they process information, I can be more effective in communicating with them. That was a, and then the third aha, which hit me really hard was one you just talked about. You know, all of the literature shows us pretty conclusively that better decisions are made if we have cognitive diversity in our group. It's right. really key. And that dawned on me, this was another measure of cognitive diversity. I think there are others, but this being one of problem solver profile diversity, and then recognizing, you know, Cheryl's a detective, I'm a detective as well, but we get somebody else like Ari, who's clearly a visionary. And we, and we then start and say, wow, Ari's in charge of the vision, Cheryl and Paul are in charge of the research, right? <laughs> and we can build a team. But then it starts to say to me, it really gets one more underpinning of this diversity and inclusion and how powerful it can be in decision making, which at the end of the day is all we're trying to do. Is that a fair frame of the book in your mind? I do think that it is absolutely fair to recognize that we haven't thought about diversity of thought, right? And so let's introduce everybody to the five problem solver profiles. I gave them fun names so that we can help remember them because we we think in language. So there's the adventurer, the detective, the listener, the thinker, and the visionary. The adventurer is generally a confident decision maker and finds the future endlessly more fascinating than the present. And so she is somebody who is able to make a lot of decisions. This has an underlying cognitive bias of optimism bias to it because she tends to think that if she makes a poor decision, she can make another decision. And it's a beautiful way to move through the world. For you and I, Paul, we are detectives. We tend to really value the evidence. And we like to think of ourselves as rational. And an underlying cognitive bias of that could be the confirmation bias. We're good at research. We know how to find something where we really think that we can confirm our thinking. And we may tend to overvalue data rather than people. The listener is almost the opposite. Now you've got somebody who is generally has a close group of friends, is a collaborative decision maker, really appreciates consensus, and the cognitive bias that I might think about that goes with this is social proof. She really wants to know what the other people of her trusted advisors of her group think so that she can help build that collaborative, cooperative decision-making. The fourth is the thinker. For the thinker, the action's really between their ears. They tend to spend much more time in the problem solving than in the decision-making. And they really want to know their options and evaluate them one against each other. This has a frame blindness or a relativity bias where they may see the opportunity set but not really be able to see beyond it. And then finally, you've got the visionary. This is somebody who really likes to be an original thinker, often somebody who's very creative and a key cognitive bias for the visionary might be something like the scarcity bias, where they tend to overvalue something that seems original when something that's perfectly mundane, obvious, easy, might really suit the decision that they have in front of them. Do, do individuals have only one profile so it's a great question. So the profiles are not proscripted. Think of it like handedness. Generally, we tend to prefer doing things with our right or left hand. It's just more comfortable and it's easy, but we can certainly learn to be ambidextrous if we put in that effort. And the problem solver profiles, not only can we change over time in part by learning all five and in trying on the different profiles for different kinds of decisions, but we also have something that I call situationality, which is how our place, our life stage, our level of decision ownership and our experience tend to impact us for the decisions that we make. Many of us have had the experience that out in the big world, we believe that we make decisions in a certain way, but no matter what age we are, put us back in our childhood home or in a setting with our parents, and we may revert to a different decision-making style. And that can happen, and we can be overtaken 
by situationality to show up differently, but we can also learn to be different in part by recognizing our own problem solver profile and in working to build the skills of the other problem solver profiles. It sounds like that once somebody finds out what their problem solver, they're natural, as you said, left-handed or right-handed in us, you're right. natural leaning. And then the next thing probably should be is to understand what the most common biases would be along that profile. And then to develop some skills or scaffolding or people in your team that will help offset those natural biases or flags that would say, hey, for me, confirmation bias, I'm a detective, so confirmation. If you could have a flag or an individual. And then it sounds like you might want to start to develop, well, certainly empathy for the other four just in your own group, but then maybe even start to develop some skills along, right? Add some listening capability or add a little bit, get more comfortable with sort of being a bit of a visionary, thinking about it. Is that a I might to change the order of that, Paul. Um, I think naturally we'd gravitate towards who am I, right? So that's the entry point. You go to app.areamethod, A-R-E-A method.com. You can take the quiz. And at the end of the quiz, you will have self-categorized yourself into one of these five profiles and you'll get your results. From there, by reading Problem Solver, you can learn about your strengths and the key cognitive biases that I've cross-referenced with your particular Problem Solver profiles. But then I would think that the next step would be to read and learn all five of the problem solver profiles so you can see what else is out there i think one of the wonderful opportunities of the problem solver profiles is that previously we may have thought of other people with whom we make decisions whether it's a good friend or a family member or a coworker, she's hasty or he takes forever or this person gets stuck in the weeds these are derogatory terms where we are elevating ourselves because, of course, our way of problem solving is best and denigrating somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Now, with the problem solver profiles, you can recognize that you're simply optimizing for different things. So as you do that, but can I then should I then try to build some skills that strengthen my natural tendency? Well, you can strengthen your skills from your natural tendency, but cognitive biases are two sides of the same coin. The same reason why something is a positive for you, what makes the adventurer confident is that she can make a new decision. So the optimism bias plays out both ways. Because she's optimistic that she can make a new decision, she can make decisions easily. At the same time, that optimism bias may preclude her from having really examined the decision, which may mean that she makes a suboptimal decision or only solves part of the problem that she thinks she's solving. So you'd want to understand how the cognitive biases both our strengths and then are also pitfalls or blind spots that can get in your way. And then the cheetah sheets throughout the book help you to bolster your strengths, minimize those pitfalls learn from the other problem solver profiles and boost your ability to be more dynamic by learning some of the skills that the other profiles have. You've interacted with certainly hundreds of people in this exercise. Can you give a couple of examples of maybe a professional and a personal example where using this to you talked about your relationship with your mother, maybe you want to talk more about that. But can you give an example, professional example and a personal example from either a client or your own life or friends that really changed the way they approached the decision because of the insights? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I have a new article that came out yesterday in Harvard Business Review on the problem solver profiles and teams. And the CEO um, of the organization that I write about in this article is somebody who's an adventurer. But her core leadership team, her chief financial officer, her head of retail, her head of business development, these are a group of primarily listeners and a thinker. So you've got somebody who moves very quickly with a core leadership team that moves a lot slower in terms of how they make decisions. And so she previously would come into the meetings with a lot of ideas. 
And over time, she began to feel like she was the only one coming with ideas. Why didn't anybody else care about the very important cause, the mission and the vision? And why wasn't there momentum from other people in her leadership team? And then once everybody on the team took the problem solver profile and she recognized that these people were not coming forward in part because she was always bringing her ideas. And so they were then responding and talking about her ideas that they needed more time to bring forward. Well, how did they actually process that information? How do they think about it? And what are the ideas that they'd like to share? for how to move forward. She was able to recognize that in changing her behavior to better make space for the problem solver profiles that she had assembled, that she was able to have a much more productive relationship with each of these people. And she was able also to get them to be much more comfortable coming forward with their own ideas by creating back, space. Back, back up three sentences. You said she changed her behavior. How did she change her behavior? Well, she noticed, first of all, that these were different problem solver profiles optimizing for different things. So the listener wanted to hear everybody's ideas so that she could hear what everybody thought about and then begin to have a conversation that builds on an understanding of how everybody was thinking about the issue. For the thinker, he really wanted to know his options. So she could come into the meeting and she could basically say, for instance, here's a couple different scenarios that I've asked you to consider. And she could send them out prior to the meeting. And she could say to everybody, I want you to come with your ideas. Well, now she's given them the space and the time to operate in their comfort zones now she's at a much more productive meeting where everybody's been given that space and she doesn't feel like she's the only one coming with ideas. So she would come to the meeting thinking everybody else would be able to be spontaneous, debate it, think about it, argue okay. new ideas. What about, what about? And she had a team that really approached problems differently. And That's by right. Presenting them the information, choice, the decision to be made ahead of time so they could process it in their own way. Then when they brought the meeting together, everybody was warmed up for the meeting. It's not just warmed up, right? That's they've, they've been given the time to conduct their own part of the process, right? right? A, a listener and a thinker are not necessarily comfortable jumping to a solution. Some of the problem solver profiles spend more of their time in problem solving and some of them spend more of their time in solutions. So the adventurer and the visionary are very solution oriented. The detective, the thinker, and the listener spend more time in the problem. So one is leaning back and two are leaning forward. And again, understanding these differences in what they're valuing in their decision-making really is where you can build community, strengthen your relationships and make more fulfilling decisions together. So this is a case where the leader led the change in process because of the insights of the profile of her team, her key team, and then approached each person in, in where they felt most comfortable in framing the decision, giving the information, and then giving them the time they needed to do their processing. Yes, she also kept the meeting as an action right, as something that would have momentum. To her, if you're gonna have a meeting, decisions should be made. Yeah. So that meant that the problem solving, in part, she could take out the foundational piece from the meeting and allow each person to have it beforehand. So when you got to the meeting, people had formulated their thoughts more clearly. They yeah. came marshaled with the evidence that yeah, they well, needed. Yeah, have. the meeting became, the sync up of everyone's time. Some people wanted more time to process. Some people needed less time. But at the meeting, everybody had had the necessary time for them right. to be ready for the meeting. Which meant the exact conversation that she wanted to have in the first case scenario was now possible. Got it, got it, got In it, the got second it. scenario. All right, uh, do you have a personal example where this? Well, a personal example was during COVID, just coming back to my mother, I realized my parents are in their 80s and um, I didn't know anything about any of their passwords, any of their bank accounts, any of any of that kind of stuff. And my mother, who's an adventurer, I knew would find this a boring activity 
and would immediately say, oh, I'm not doing that. But my dad is a detective. So the first thing that I did is I didn't call or drop over and say, hey, what are your passwords? I wrote this in an email. I sent it to both of them so that my mom's immediate rejection would be heard by my father, who could then say, well, Judy, this is a great idea. Now, when I then was invited over to get the passwords, my dad, the detective, opened his spreadsheet. My mom went to a cabinet, took out a folder filled with many small slips of paper. Mm. And even the same password, many times in different variations, was in that folder. So we had no idea which one was the current <laughs> password. So you could see how this could be frustrating. It could hurt my relationship. And this could completely fail. But in knowing the problem solver profiles, I was able to develop a strategy that was going to work for them and was going to give them, again, the space and the time to interact the way that they needed to so that we could have a really good experience and some good laughs together when we finally found out all their passwords. <laughs> You, you you know your parents well. We all know our parents all too well. And you know your family members well. And you know your close friends well. How do you find out the profile of somebody at work or somebody that you're on a committee with or somebody you're at the PTA with or something? So it's, it's a great question. Obviously, if you know somebody well enough, you can ask them to take the problem solver profile. But if you can't, in the cheetah sheets, in problem solver, I go through how would you do this? And I give you a series of questions. The other thing is when you look at each of the profiles and you begin to understand that they're each optimizing for different things and they each have different cognitive biases associated, you can also listen differently. So I feel like for me, it's made me, I hope, a more acute listener. What are the verbs that somebody or using in the sentences, what kind of questions are they asking? What do they seem most interested in? And by learning the different problem solver profiles, I can use that information to look for clues in conversations with other people to figure out, oh, this person is probably a detective or this person is a listener. And what I find is so fun and as somebody coming, you know, out of the financial world who likes investigations, there's this wonderful mystery as you're talking to somebody to try to figure out what they are so that you can work better with them no matter what you're doing. I assume that in you, as you do this, you get a bit better at it and as you get more insights. And then it, I would hope it would change the questions you'd asked your coworkers or your colleagues and might say, hey, I'm thinking about this. How would you think about this? Or how would you do this? Or what information would you like to have if we're going to make this decision? I assume you can probe a bit in a non-threatening way to get more information. Yeah. You absolutely can. Look, you can, if you don't feel like you can ask somebody and, you know, you feel uncomfortable allowing the conversation to just unfold where you're listening for these clues, you can also say, what do you need to make a decision? Right. What kind of information speaks to you? What are the first three things that you want in order to be able to solve this problem? And that right there, asking some of these very simple questions will let you know what they're optimizing for, what they really value. And then by knowing the problem solver profiles, you'll have so much more information about you know, how to work well with that person. Yeah, you know, I was thinking that you, you almost would, there could be some an, interesting benefit if you added this to the HR process. So we're out recruiting yeah. and we know our team is highly detective. We just built a bunch of detectives, maybe maybe because of our natural biases, maybe because we hire people we like, but then you're saying, you know, we could really use a few other profiles on this. And I suspect that you can't necessarily ask candidates to take the quiz, although I'm intrigued by the opportunity thought, um, but say, boy, we really need somebody who's more of an adventurer. We need somebody, or maybe there's too many listeners. We need somebody who's a bit more action oriented in this role. I would say, you know, for the companies where we've worked very extensively throughout the whole company, they are actively using it in the HR process. And, you know, I think it makes a huge difference because just as we remember going through school, 
right? Each year you had to learn what the different teachers wanted, right? Some teachers want a lot of details when you're writing your essays and some want to basically know that you've understood the larger concepts, but they don't really need to know the years that something happened, for example. And it's difficult to constantly figure out how to work for somebody who is not the person that you worked with previously. So using this in the HR process, what we found has been incredibly fulfilling because if you're hiring a chief of staff or a chief development officer or whatnot, and you need to work with a CEO who has a specific problem solver profile, taking this into account makes a huge difference. As you see in Problem Solver, one of the main stories I tell is about this unbelievable nonprofit that is trying to interrupt child sex trafficking in India. And the co-founders are both visionaries. Well, if you have two visionaries at the helm, they were constantly changing the strategy. And they initially felt like they were constantly changing the strategy of the organization because the problem is just too difficult. It's this age old, intractable, terrible problem that necessitated that they constantly change their strategy. Well, once we began working together, what they realized is that their risk tolerance, their comfort level, and their value of the new and the original is what was causing them to change the strategy. And that wasn't what actually was going to be best for the organization. So you can also think about what it is that you actually need to be more sustainable, to be able to work well with other people and to work directly with a supervisor that needs something different from how they approach a problem. A question that came up in the chat and we'll, we circle back to it. And that is, is, is this preordained or is it just, as you say, once we learn it's the path to, leaning into the strengths and being aware of the weaknesses? I'm so glad that we're getting to answer this question. There are other assessments out there, like a Myers-Briggs that many people have probably heard about. And those basically say, this is who you are. The problem solver profile is not proscriptive. Earlier, I used the example of handedness that most of us feel more comfortable with the right or the left hand. And that's a comfort zone. Right. But by learning the problem solver profiles, it'll tell you, therefore, what you've tended to do when you're in a perfunctory mode and you're going through your day and making decisions. But then by learning all of the problem solver profiles, you can choose to do something different. You can go to the supermarket like a visionary. You can buy insurance like a detective. You can go on vacation as a listener. You can pick and choose and ask yourself, What's uncomfortable about this? And then by identifying that discomfort, it's not bad. It's like weightlifters who do uncomfortable mobility exercises. That's where you build your flexibility, your agility, and your ability to be more dynamic as a decision maker. Yeah, I like to think I've added skills over time, but being a detective, that is always my go-to. Until I've oh. checked that box, there's nothing's happening. And I've gotten faster at it, um, but yeah, I need lots of data as fast as I possibly can. And then I'm willing to experiment with these other profiles. But um, I'm in the middle of writing a book, <laughs> like why? Um, and I found myself just in a deep rabbit hole on something that's gonna be one sentence in the book. But I had to figure out the source of this. And so I've spent 20 hours on something that will be one sentence in the book. <laughs> And you probably feel better for it. I would just say- I couldn't write the, I couldn't write the sentence without doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world of the detective. I would say though, that because I know that my detective has a lot of ossification around it, I have really tried to ask myself to take one of these cheetah pauses and reflect before I come into a meeting because oftentimes I'll want to start right in the meeting, so to speak, in the topic, in the content. And I forget sometimes that I'm working with other people. I want to ask them how they are. I want to set the stage for the meeting. I want us to all align around the success metrics. And so reminding myself that I actually want to hold my detective 
to the side while I bring forward a listener or bring forward a visionary, I think is, is very helpful. It's difficult, but I hope that it makes it nicer to be in a meeting with me. Yeah, but I, I, I suspect, maybe unfair comment, but I suspect in every meeting, you know way more than anybody else. No, see, I think that's also the, um, the confirmation bias of the detective, right? Is we think because we're coming armed with facts and data that we probably are better prepared than somebody else. I didn't say, I didn't say better prepared. I said, you probably know more than anybody else in the meeting. About, about 20 hours, right? Right. So I mean, that's, the, I, mean, that's the, I think that's the problem. You probably know more facts and figures and detail in the history than anybody else. That may not be the relevant information. Right. You just happen to know more than anybody else. And there's a tendency if you're a detective and you've done the work to, you've got to be very careful with that because other people are going to come with maybe much better perspectives, maybe even a better profile for that decision. And yet you've done probably more work than anybody else. I don't know if I've done more work, but I definitely hear what you're saying. And I find even with that reminder to myself, I'm much more comfortable in my detective mode than in any other. Mode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which makes sense. Interesting. Has this a approach change the way you think about teaching because now you have in the room most likely at least a few of every profile almost by definition because your class is big enough has it changed the way you've thought about presenting information so that each different profile absorbs a lot from the lesson i've definitely thought i've definitely thought about it um I've thought about what kind of momentum am I maintaining for an adventurer who wants to know that they're constantly staying engaged because we're driving towards a specific outcome. I've thought about how to make sure that the listener can come forward and feel included and heard and not rushed in the conversation. I've thought about for the thinker, how do I want to frame the different options and also make sure that we understand the larger context? And for the visionary, I've tried to make sure that I give space for something that maybe I haven't thought of, but might be a better way to look and understand what it is that we're engaging with. And yeah, so I, I definitely think so. Yeah, I really, uh, probably one of the reasons we get along so well is we're both detectives and we appreciate that approach. Um, but what I, as reading the profile, I realized over the last couple of years, I've really tried to add listening skills to counterbalance. And it felt like that they weren't opposites, but they were very complementary. That if, as a detective, we tend to go deep, 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 get a lot of information, but then can become very focused on the information we have, overwhelmed with it. And I have found if I listen to lots of perspectives, it's a nice counterbalance to the detective. And I suspect that every one of the profile has kind of a, not an opposite, but a very complementary that would really offset some of the natural biases and kind of, you could almost pair them up a little bit that way. That's something that I've been doing a lot of work with ever since the book came out is recognizing that when you have different groups of people, you're moving at different paces based on the profiles and that they counterbalance each other, just as you said, in very, in very nice ways, right? So if you have a detective with an adventurer, that can work really well. If you have a visionary with a listener or with a thinker that can work very well. But the truth is, is just having the diversity in the room as well as having those questions in mind when you recognize that you don't have the diversity so you can bring in the five different perspectives really just reminds you that there are these different ways to look at a problem. But as you said earlier, when you gave your example which I thought was great about the woman and the organization, about allowing people the necessary time to be ready for the meeting. That's clearly got to be part of it. You have this cognitive diversity on your team or you have some surrogates. People are saying, I'm going to speak for the adventure that we don't have, but I'm going to take that role on. Giving people the amount of time they need that when they come together for the decision action, they have, I use the phrase warmed up. You said just prepared to participate. I think that that's really important. Absolutely. I think it really 
can make you think about where are the relationships where I have friction? And then using the problem solver profiles, you can really reduce that. You can really reduce that friction. And what it does is it gives you proactive ways to think about how to alter your own behavior. That, and I, that embodiment of the change of the behavior is the beginning of breaking of habits and patterns that are well-worn that build that agility, that flexibility, and that dynamism. That's one of the things I picked up right away after I kind of said, oh, learned more about myself, reminded of the kind of biases I bring to it. Instantly, it gave me this, holy smokes, when I interact with Cheryl, when I interact with somebody else, actually go in thinking, how do they approach it? And maybe the friction is because I'm trying to force my frame or my timetable on them, which is I mean, probably unfair in that sense. I think it also really can show you um, why the friction exists, just as you're saying. So if you're somebody who can't understand why somebody else isn't getting what you're saying, right? You're saying it over and over. You really feel like you're in the right. If you look at what is right for you, you can all of a sudden recognize that that's from your perspective. That's yeah. from your vantage point. But being right doesn't necessarily mean that you're happy or that you're productive or that you're effective. And yeah. the truth of the matter is that's why we constantly need this perspective taking so that we can actively build this collaborative backbone of how to work well with us. Yeah, you, there are very few decisions in a vacuum. Very few decisions are solo, and that's really important. Um, it, question did get uh, submitted, and I'm going to read it because it's really well written, <laughs> and I would only mangle it if I changed it. So here's the quote. So this individual is talking in the first person, not Paul in the first person. I'm often accused of overthinking and overanalyzing a situation. So what profile is that? Uh, so that's the thinker. The thinker can really end up in analysis paralysis. The thinker is not maximizing for the best possible outcome. The thinker has a loss aversion. He or she is worried about making a mistake, and that's what keeps them in the problem solving. So right, other, by than, other than uh, having uh, buying your book, what should the thinker, what's the next step for the thinker? Look, the thinker can do a couple, can do a couple things. First, they can decide when they need to make the decision and give themselves a deadline, right? The second thing that they can do is in using some of the core area method tools, they can come up with a vision of success. The vision of success is when we invert problem solving. Instead of starting with, how am I going to solve this problem, where now you've got something that's wide open and equals all, you can invert the process and you can instead ask yourself, well, what has to happen in the outcome of the decision for me to know that it has been a success? Notice you don't need to know how you're going to solve the problem. You've skipped over that and you're recognizing what's happened after you've made the decision that shows you that the decision has been a success. Now you at least have a very clear North Star. This is what I'm solving for. And then that is another way that the thinker can sort of feel unstuck, feel some forward momentum and have an easier time in their decision making. Two different tools. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I think that we, we sometimes feel that we're stuck in our own and we can't get out of our own way. And I think the book is very helpful in that it, it shows you that, ah, this is my natural process. We, we've given a framework to it, which is great. And oh, wait a minute. There are people that think differently, but also maybe I can think differently. I can develop some more skills. I can be aware of it. And maybe I get frustrated with myself in situations because I naturally lean into a process. But to be aware of that and stop and catch your breath, do a cheetah sheet maybe, um, and then maybe collaborate with somebody else, recognizing that they're bringing a different skill set to it. Absolutely. You know, it's very hard to get out of our own way, especially when we don't have any language for it. So the problem solver profiles actually give us a lexicon so that we actually can think about and use the terminology so that we can mull over the meaning of how we interact 
what actually is our perspective and what are the different opportunities from the other problem solver profiles. I love that. I love that. I thought that was a real, for me as a detective, that was a real insight in the book. All right, we're going to add Jim and David back to the conversation. I think they're going to give me a break and they have some questions I want to ask. Well, I'd just like to say it was a, been a very thought provoking conversation to say the minimum. And I'd like to encourage uh, folks in the audience, you can still uh, uh, submit some questions. We have a few minutes left. But my question is simply this this is all very scientific. What's the role of intuition? I think intuition always plays a role, and the adventurer really operates from intuition, right? Because intuition is some kind of a process that we haven't actually named, right? But it's a it's some kind of a process nonetheless. For the adventurer, she's moving forward in part based on her gut. It's telling her to do something specific. For the listener, she may have a much tougher time finding her own inner voice, right? And so for the listener, in part because she is so good at collecting the voices of other people, maybe asking herself first, what do I think in this situation? Or why am I solving this problem? Makes it more useful before she talks to other people and collects their opinions because then she knows how to use them better. So some of the profiles have a much stronger inner voice than others. The visionary also has a very strong inner voice because the visionary sees the rainbows that not all of us see. I'm just glad I'm not a detective. <laughs> Let's speak of that. The detective Cheryl, um, a couple of thoughts on this. First, how did you come up with this paradigm uh, as a detective? But then also secondly, because I know you've had some famous mentees and maybe you might want to mention one or two, uh, if that's okay. And then I'm just curious, both you and Paul, did you have mentors as part of any of this or your groundbreaking work in life? So um, shortly after my first book came out, Problem Solved, which is on personal and professional decision making, I had been talking with the co-founder and chief executive of a nonprofit that works with high schoolers. And he actually told me that the number one request that he gets from high school principals is help for teenagers with decision making. And he had said to me, can you adopt area for high schoolers? And I thought, what an interesting time in life, right? It is this moment of identity formation where you are still generally living in your parents' house and having somebody or several people tell you what to do. But you're also really beginning to say, well, what about me? What do I think and what do I feel? And what an interesting moment to start to think about decision-making. And so this CEO had asked me, could I develop a boot camp to work with high schoolers to test this idea of teaching them decision-making? And actually the initial incarnation of the problem solver profile of this idea about giving them something immediate because they're used to assessments, they're used to learning new learning tools, was where this idea was initially born. And on a rainy Sunday in March, back when Problem Solve first came out, a whole bunch of high schoolers from Brooklyn and Newark came together and the room was very quiet when they initially began to use the problem solver profile on their phones. And then immediately there were all these voices at once. And that initial excitement made me realize how hungry we are to better understand ourselves. And that's really where the idea came from. And I talk about this in Problem Solver. Um, for um, famous people, I think you're mentioning that Tony Blair um, wrote one of the blurbs for this book and he wrote the forward to Problem Solved um, and Investing in Financial Research. And he's somebody who I admire as a decision maker and how he is able to really cut through a lot of details to get to the through line of what is going on with a situation. And then I also had a very wonderful mentor when I was first out of the Graduate School of Journalism and I worked for a small publication called Investment Dealers Digest, 
a wonderful editor there named Ron Cooper, who I felt used to talk to me about not giving people the phone book. Don't give them too many details. Tell them why they need the phone book. And I used to really keep that in mind because as Paul knows too well, sometimes it's too easy to just junk up anything with too many facts. Always. Paul, did you have a mentor? Uh, yes, but it's a funny story. When I was a teenager, I was pretty close to my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and he's very successful in business. And I asked him, what do you subscribe your success to? He said, when I was in my 20s, I would go in Seattle, Washington. I go to the Seattle Public Library every Saturday morning from nine till noon and read books. And I said, what did you read? He said, the business section. I said, which section? He said, no, the business section. I would just go pick a book. I'd read for three hours. I'd put it back and I'd come back the next Saturday. And he said, I did that for about five years. And what I learned from that was books are my mentor. And I am a voracious reader and always have a book either on my phone or in my hand. And I'm always reading. So my biggest mentor has been uh, other authors, frankly, who have spent an enormous, Cheryl, I don't know how many hours you put in your book. I got a free copy, but uh, <laughs> even if I had paid $30 for it, I got you know, 400 hours of thinking by somebody who's brilliant for $30. And so the best value investment I've ever come up with is buying books and reading them. <laughs> you, made, you made a lot of comments about uh, the importance of diversity in the group, different, different styles. What about uh, cultural diversity? Uh, or you know, ethnic diversity, just uh, going beyond the five categories. How do you, how do you see I that? Think, I think diversity of all kinds is very important. I really do. My point with the problem solver profiles is this is the kind of diversity that we haven't thought about. And we can't see it and we can't hear it. And we may look at a group that looks very diverse or sounds diverse. People come uh, with a variety of languages but we won't know that their thinking is diverse until we really begin to think about the problem solver profiles. I was just curious about the dangers of groupthink, particularly with power dynamics and how, how you've thought about that. You know, you've got the leaders got this version and you might be a detective or a thinker, but you're a little concerned about speaking up and then groupthink takes over. Um, is that a danger when you work with teams? I think it's a very big danger because as I was saying, you often go into an organization and you work with a group that looks diverse or sounds diverse. And then you realize that they're all approaching the problem the same way. And then they go ahead and they make a decision. And there's a huge gap that they have in the software. Sorry to interrupt, but David's really talking about a, a subtler problem. Let's just say we've assembled a group. We've got some good detectives. There are researchers. We've got some visionaries. We've got a nice group of diversity. But if you have a leader that's not listening, not taking perspective, not leveraging the diversity, then effectively you end up with group think, which is the collapsing of diversity. I think it's that second step where the leader is not listening, not taking perspective, not listening in the sense of a listening profile, but not taking the input from the, the benefits of the diversity. David, I think I, that's for your question. Right? Yeah, I think it's a very important point. If you come back to the example that we talked about of the CEO who is the adventurer with this core team of listeners and thinkers, she felt completely unsupported. And she also felt that um, she didn't have the right team in place, in part because she was coming only from her perspective and how she was thinking. And then people were actually not stepping forward and sharing their thoughts and their insights and their suggestions because they didn't think she was open to it. So they were then responding to how she was interacting with them. It's exactly what you're saying. It becomes a very difficult dynamic. I think many of us have, have had this experience, whether it is you know, in a group that we've worked with on a school project, or whether it is at one of the places of employment where we've been. Well, great. Well, thank, thank you to both of you. If you want to find out more about being an adventurer, a thinker, a detective, a listener, a visionary, go to Area Method. Dot com. I'll tell you one good decision, which was to put 
you and Paul on together today <laughs> on behalf of the CFA and the Gullies School. We are so thankful to our audience. This has been some 20 events since the fall or so, and we will be back again next fall. So thank you very much from all of us. And again, special appreciation to Cheryl and Paul. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks.